Hello, everybody out there in Chem 111 land. Welcome to the new way we work. OK. Trying to find there. I have the chat window open. Um, so the two windows I'd like you to look at so far um, are the participants button down at the bottom, um, where you can see then these icons. So everybody, please click the participants button. Um, once you've done this, um, please go into this menu and click a thumbs up. I, li I like that too. Okay, good. Okay, a couple of people said yes, a couple of people said no. One applause, one thumbs down. <laughs> this is like when people d dislike my videos on YouTube. It's like, what's well, not, you know, you don't like Half-Life. Is that really my... I don't know. I don't know what to do about it. Okay, so three people need a break. Good. Okay. So this is one place um, that will ask questions as the as the lecture goes on, or we'll do some work. Um, and here's where you can let me know whether you've successfully done the thing. Um, so cool. Okay, I'm going to clear all that in just a second. This is also a place where you can raise your hand. Um, I should see. The, well, not that. Where is it? Yeah, raise hand. So I don't get raise hand because I'm um, the host, which is weird. I can't raise my hand. But um, y'all can raise your hands, and that should give me a list up here as well. Um, so that's cool. OK, I'm going to clear those. Um, so you shouldn't need to put your hand down or anything like there. Um, and then the other thing, oh, I don't have it here. Um, if you go next to that, you can open up the chat window. Um, for some of you, I don't think you can see this, but at the bottom where you have participants, you have to go to the right where it says more with the three dots, and then you can open up the chat window. Um, here's where it's probably the easiest way. Um, so Evan just said, hello, Chem 111 to me. So to Jesse, that's cool. Um, you can send a chat here, and myself and the instructional support uh, folks who are working with us will get the questions in front of me. So if we're going and it's, um, this is probably an easier way to get this to me than to open up the microphone. So please type your questions in here if you have them in the chat window. Otherwise, I think we're just gonna, just gonna move along. Um, at 12.10, so it's 12.04 now, um, at 12.10, I tried my first ever scheduled sends. You should receive an email at your CSUMB Gmail at 12.10 with a link to today's quiz. Um, and as I suggested in the email I sent earlier today, you'll want to have your notes handy um, if you took notes on the thermodynamics videos. Um, and also having the textbook open is going to be handy because there's just two questions in there and then one sort of survey question that it will say is wrong because I don't know how to make Google give you the points, but I'll give everybody the points for that. And then we'll upload that for today's quiz grade. Um, how is everybody? Please give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down to indicate where you are. I like this better in class because you can put your thumb sideways um, and say meh, but not in here. So be it. Yeah, I know. Someone just suggested that. I don't. I don't know. We can. I can email Zoom's customer service and tell them we need a thumbs sideways logo um, to say I'm doing me. I have a solution. Okay. Okay. What's What's that? <laughs> what's Please go ahead. In video. Oh, I can't. I'm, I don't have your video up right now. I don't actually know where that is. Uh, no, I'm not, hang on, I'm not able to, oh, there, I see, there, now I see the video, go ahead, Evan, yeah, okay, so we can do it by video, but it's not, um, it's not quite so feasible to get all 99 of us to do that and, and see it, but I appreciate that, um, okay, we have 40-ish, yeah, someone, okay, so someone's clicking thumbs up, thumbs down, and I see that going back and forth. That'll work. So we have about 40 people giving thumbs up, about 20 people giving a thumbs down. Um, yeah, that's how it's going. Um, it, these are, um, one of the old um, people that I worked with in industry used to say that uh, an, a traditional curse um, was, may you live in interesting times. Uh, I think that we do. Um, so I appreciate all y'all showing up today and being willing to try something new with me. Um, 
we're all going to learn stuff together. Um, so I really appreciate your willingness to, to try these things out with me. So thanks for that. Um, as I said, please feel free to use the chat window as we go along. Um, your quiz will come by email in just a few minutes. Um, but today we will go through work. Hang on, let me just move that. Okay. Okay, so we'll go through free energy and thermodynamics. Um, I got a question in the chat window that says, will our next test be after spring break? The way you want to get to that, let me get rid of this for a second, um, is actually here in iLearn. So um, in the syllabus, at the end of that, you can always check that for the schedule. That includes um, updated dates and the Alex due dates I pushed back again a little bit today, so you can check those due dates there. So they're now all Sundays. Um, short answer is the test is not the not the week we come back from spring break, but the week after that. So we have a little bit of buffer after spring break. Will our quizzes always be at 1210? We're going to try that. I think that'll work. Um, that way we can get sort of get in here and get organized to make sure we know what we're doing, and then the quizzes will show up at 1210. But if that doesn't work, then we'll move that. Um, yeah, so if you look in... The syllabus, um, the updated how do we do things information is almost all on page two. And then at the very end, scroll, 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 here's the updated um, schedule. So down here on April 15th, what was tax day, which I assume will be moved back because federal government be busy right now, um, we will have exam two. Um, and I'll give you more details on what that'll look like as we get closer to that. But then at least we have a week after spring break. So that's cool. Let's see. OK. How are we doing? Tax day got moved back three months, says somebody. Wow. Well, I already did mine, so that's cool. Let's see what else are we OK. So let's go back to this for now. Free energy and thermodynamics. The quiz today will include a couple of questions on delta G. Um, or if you'd like to be really classy about it, you can say delta G. That's not funny. But so now what's weird about this is that I, I get to react to everybody not laughing at my jokes virtually. Um, somebody actually just left the meeting. I guess that's how bad that joke was. Um, yeah, OK, so your email should come in about a minute. Um, and we'll just kind of hang out until that does. And then please do that quiz. Um, and we will, ch when you are done with the quiz, let's clear this. When you're done with the quiz, um, give me a thumbs up on here. Um, and otherwise we will start again at 1225. Um, so get after it. Um, if you have questions about the quiz, you can type it here into the chat. Um, and otherwise um, get after that with your notes and I'll talk to you again soon. Thanks y'all. See you at 1225. Um, unless you type at me with questions earlier. John, did you already send the email out? Yeah, I'm not getting an email. Me neither. Where am I? Yeah, neither am I. Has anyone gotten it? No, I'm still waiting on it. No, I'm no not. I haven't gotten it. Not at all. Okay, a couple of people have mentioned they have not gotten the email, which I assume means nobody has, but let me let me check and this, this is my first scheduled send and it looks like it didn't go. Let's see, what if I did something wrong? Yeah, it didn't go. Um, I'll fix it. Give me a moment. I love technology. What if you put the link in the chat? Yeah, I can do that. The email came I just through. got it. Okay, so it's getting a little bit late. Um, it's also in here. Um, as you as you like it, go ahead and work on that quiz. Thanks, everybody.
All right, all you fine people out there, there are about eight or nine people um, dropping steadily who have not yet submitted the quiz. Um, if that it describes you, please do that in the next minute or so. I guess it got sent out one minute late, but let's get these in and then we talk about that. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so a couple of questions about the quiz. Let's see, one was, do we get half credit on quizzes for a problem? And the second one, I got one out of two. Um, I will go back and grade these. These aren't automatically submitted to iLearn. It gets, it um, dumps out a spreadsheet. So I'll go back in there and give credit for the ones that there was a typo on and things like that. Um, and the first one, the survey question where it marks everything wrong, just because I can't figure out the right text for it. Um, and then I went in and changed the answer with, that had the typo RTLNK to negative RTLNK. Since I did that after people had submitted, it's doing all sorts of crazy stuff. But so um, short answer is don't worry about um, what you did. Um, on the quiz so much. Um, as long as you understand what we're doing here, I'll make sure everybody gets the points. Let's see. Another question is attendance taken in discussion. If you do the, there too, there's like a survey link to a Google form. That's how those points are given. Um, so if you missed the first one um, because you had something else going on, I would say um, just email your instructor and, and, and it should be no problem. We'll get it all worked out um, for that. Let's see. Um, another question about the negative RTLNK. Let's go through that content now. Um, and please believe me when I say I will make it get you all the points. Um, okay, so let's begin here. Delta G naught equals two things from that list. One is it should be negative, but negative RT times the natural log of K. Um, here, delta G is the free energy. The naught means standard conditions, which means um, all chemicals are at one molar or one atmosphere. Um, question was, will I be posting these notes to iLearn? Uh, yes, I will post these notes to iLearn that you're, what you see on your screen right now. Um, if I can get them to print as a PDF one way or another, I'll figure out how to get that onto iLearn. And I'm also recording this as I usually do. So the video of everything we do today will also be available. Um, okay, this is gas constant, 8.314. Did I do that right? Yeah, joules per mole Kelvin. T is temp in Kelvin. Um, and capital K, capital K is equilibrium constant, same as it ever was. So this was one of the things that delta G equaled in that um, sort of multiple choice thing, um, multiple checkbox. Delta G is the free energy. That's the energy that's taken in or released in total as a reaction progresses from wherever it is to wherever it goes. Um, this is not one of those wherever you go, there you are type of things. This is wherever it is, it will go to equilibrium because all reactions will progress towards equilibrium if the kinetics allow. And this is saying when it goes from where it is to equilibrium, how much energy is taken in or given out? Um, so that we can compare apples to apples, the, the naught, um, which is this sort of zero looking uh, degree symbol up here, um, 
is taken to be one molar everything or one atmosphere of everything. So if you start with one molar of every reactant and every product in a balanced reaction, and you let it go to equilibrium, where things could be any, any different um, concentration, how much energy is released? If you have a negative delta G, that's how much energy is released. If you have a positive delta G, that's how much energy has to be put into the system in terms of both enthalpy, delta H, and entropy, delta S. Um, the, where it is at that equilibrium constant is why there's a K um, in this equation. So that's that first one. And make a little space. The next one, which we'll use in the next question, is delta G naught equals delta H, again, naught minus T delta S. And here, this is the free energy, delta G. This is enthalpy, which is usually um, heat or the energy that you get from the stabilization of the bonds. And this is entropy, which is often called related to randomness or disorder. That's a useful way to think about it. More technically correct would be the number of different ways you can arrange a system. And there are things that are even more correct than that um, that we can talk about in office hours if you're curious about entropy. Um, basically, this is saying that enthalpy goes in the same direction as delta G. That is, if you have a negative delta H, that's good for the reaction being spontaneous because if delta G is negative, reaction is spontaneous. And you'll see that I sometimes will drop the naught symbol that goes with the delta G. Um, all of these things are true, whether you have the naught or not. Ha ha ha. OK, that was a bad enough joke. Look, nine people left the lecture because that joke was so bad. Um, yeah, OK, so, <laughs> so somebody, somebody laughed at me in the chat there. I appreciate that. Um, the naught means you're comparing going from standard conditions, one molar everything, all the way to equilibrium. If you don't have the naught symbol, it means you might not be at one molar. This is really common, right? Because one molar is actually not a common way for all chemicals to be. And all these equations, um, well, this equation still works when you're not at one molar. Um, for the K one, there's a different equation that has Q in it. But this one here, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, still works whether you're comparing the one molar case or not. Um, these are the two that were intended to be the right answers in that multiple choice, and that's good because the second one you need for the next question that was on that little quiz, which is you're given a delta H, and you can see my handwriting improve as I put the thing in tablet mode, um, but delta H is negative 75 kilojoules per mole, and delta S is negative 405 joules per mole Kelvin. And it's asked, is the reaction spontaneous? Oops, hang on a sec. Is the reaction spontaneous at um, at 25 degrees Celsius? So I look at this and I think, okay, I got delta H and delta S and I'm asked about spontaneity. Spontaneity is related to delta G. Is there an equation that has both delta G and delta S in it? And delta H rather? Yes, that's the one that we did above, the reaction spontaneous. So what I'm looking for is reframing this question is, is delta G not negative. Um, that's another way of saying, is the reaction spontaneous? Because if delta G is negative, then the answer is yes. So I'll get the blank equation, which you can always get from the equation sheet, um, or in this case, your notes, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. And let's just plug everything in and see what we got. Delta G is what I want, so I'll leave that as the variable. Delta H is here, but that's in kilojoules per mole. And I can see delta S has joules, not kilojoules. I'm in the habit of converting everybody to joules. So I'll do that. Um, if you prefer to convert everything to kilojoules, that should work just fine. Minus, let's see, T delta S. T is 25C but that means 298 Kelvin. Um, and you can include the numbers after the decimal place if you prefer, should work out the same because we don't use enough sig figs to make that matter. Um, now we'll multiply this by 
Yes. Oh, good comment. Someone someone just commented that they, they wanted to pause the video and then remembered that we're doing this live. Um, I'm sure I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm sure I'm going to pause and say, oh, wait, I need to redo that. Let me rewind. And then I can't because I just did it live. Um, we're all we're all in this together. OK, Delta S goes in as negative 405 joules per mole Kelvin. Um, Okay, let's check out these units. Um, Kelvin here cancels. Um, I'm going to multiply this term at the right. So that is 298 times 405. Whoops, type that in wrong. 298 times 405. Oh, negative 405. So negative 120, 690. And you can just keep this in your calculator if you like, but. OK. Negative 75,000 joules per mole minus a negative 120,690 joules per mole. So this ends up the minus, the minus means it's a plus, right? So I do that. And I get delta G naught. Um, there's a question about the size of delta G. I'll get to that in just a second. Two, we started with two sig figs, I think. Three, yeah, two sig figs. So 46,000. Joules per mole. A um, couple questions about delta G, which I'll get to in just a second. Um, but answering this question before we get to those, is the reaction spontaneous? Um, what we're looking for is delta G negative. No, I got delta G was a positive number. So the reaction is what's called non spontaneous. And this, what's weird about this is that it doesn't mean that it won't happen. It just means that the products are less stable. So all things being equal, you'll find more of the reactants than you will of the product. Okay, so questions about delta G. One, um, someone asked about um, the negative sign in front of negative 75, but then found it. It was from up here. So delta H was given as negative 75 kilojoules per mole. Um, and then the other question, let's see, is the size of delta G important to consider, or is it simply about being positive or negative? If all you're trying to do is determine whether the reaction is spontaneous, then all you need is the sign. That's a really good question. Um, if you want to know how much energy is released or how much energy needs to be put into the system to make it happen, then the number for delta G matters. But if you want to know which is more stable, products or reactants, then the sign is all you need. Okay, how are we doing out there? You wanna give me a thumbs up or not? Okay, fair number of people giving thumbs up, sweet. Let's take a look through these. Um, so I looked through this and looked through the practice exam and I think it is, just as advantageous for us to go through this practice exam because now after thermodynamics we'll have done all the content for exam two um, but do remember that the exam is not the week we get back from spring break it's the week after that so we'll do one more chapter um, worth of material then um, and it's a bit of a lighter load which is nice and that'll give us more time to get ourselves organized for exam two um, but let's let's just go through this exam and see what we can find as thermodynamics um, so now we've done um, acid base chemistry, we've done buffers, we've done solubility, and we've done thermodynamics, and that'll take us through exam two. Um, so here's the first question on the practice exam, and this is the exam. Um, wait, which exam is this? Yeah, okay, so this is ex indeed um, the exam from last semester. Um, so this should be the one posted to iLearn. Um, let's take a look. 
I see delta G in the first question, so immediately I, I think, okay, this is probably um, probably thermo. So it says, please select the label for delta G, and by that, this is scantron, so it means bubble in the letter, um, for delta G dot reaction for the forward catalyzed reaction. So forward means it's going from reactants to products, and which one of these is catalyzed? Is it the A? or the, the B, well, the, the red curve or the dashed blue line. Um, question was, will this lecture be put on the YouTube channel? Yes, it will. So this is being recorded. It'll take me a second to get it um, downloaded or rendered as it always does. But yeah, this will go up um, on the YouTube as well, as it usually does, um, along with um, the printed out like PDF versions of what you see on the screen. OK. Forward catalyzed reaction. Catalyzed, uh, what a catalyst does is leave products and reactants the same, but it lowers the transition state. So that's the, the dashed blue curve here. Um, and I want delta G. Delta G is the difference, basically the products minus reactants. Almost like a Hess's law type thing. Um, so. What's the energy difference between the products and the reactants? Let's see, I can probably do like a pole thing, but I don't know how to do thumbs up or thumbs down um, for, for five choices. Um, so E, this is the energy difference between the products and the reactants. And Let's look, let's take that and let's look at question two here. Please select the label for delta G reaction. Hey, seemingly the same thing, except now it's for the forward uncatalyzed reaction. Which one is going to work for this? Well, again, products and reactants don't change just because you have a catalyst. Um, so let's look at E. Okay. Now, is the catalyzed reaction spontaneous? For yes, in the poll there, please put a yes. If you think the answer is no, please put a no. Um, and if you think there's not enough information, put a, I don't know what the second draw the symbol. Okay, put a coffee cup, or we need a break. All right, go ahead and tell me whether you think the catalyzed reaction is spontaneous. No, you need some coffee before you decide because you don't have enough information. All right, people clicking in, people clicking in. Okay, a fair number of people have clicked yes. I agree the reaction is spontaneous. Why is that? Um, a couple of different ways you can think about this. Um, one is that for the reaction to be spontaneous, delta G must be negative. If I do products minus reactants, because that's what the delta is, Um, let's look at this. Which one of these is a smaller number, the reactants or the products? Um, products are lower, so that's a small number. Small number minus a larger number. Um, and when I say that, I mean sort of the relative height of where the products are, that's lower. And the reactants are higher, that's going to be a larger number. Smaller number minus a larger number gets me a negative number. So delta G is negative. Another way you can think about this um, is simply comparing the relative stability. If the products are more stable, there's a question about what I mean by products minus reactants. I'll get to that in a sec. Um, if the products are more stable, they're lower in energy, then the reaction is spontaneous. That's another way to think about this. Um, so there's a question about what I mean by products minus reactants. I mean, um, the the delta being the difference between 
products and reactants. And I mean taking the numerical energy of the products and subtracting the numerical energy of the reactants. Does that help? You can type in the chat whether that was helpful or not. Okay, so a couple of people said yes. Um, one said no. I'm happy to talk more about that um, offline in the help doc or in office hours. Um, so we'll keep going to the next question, but um, put a put a pin in that one if you want to talk about that more. I'm happy to do that. Okay. Oh dear. Oh dear. Lots of chemicals. I see things that look like acids and bases, but I also see delta Gs. Oh man, it's almost as if um, chemistry is all connected. Let's see the y value. So someone asked um, about the last one is as in the y value of the products minus the y value of the reactants. That's right. Yeah, the y values of each one is what the delta means in delta G. Okay, let's see here. What are we doing? Calculating the overall delta G reaction. I have two steps. How would you find what to do here if you're not sure what to do here? For now, I would recommend going back to your notes from the videos or the textbook and saying, what happens when I have two different reactions and I have an overall? Um, this is one where we've seen this a couple of times now where, let me just actually make a space and we'll do this chart. Um, so if um, I realize now that I scrolled this away and some people might have been trying to copy this down, um, if you want to have this whole document in front of you, you can go to the practice exams folder on iLearn. This is the practice exam two from last semester. Um, so I'll leave that up there for anyone who's still trying to get that down, but let's see. Manipulate a reaction. Um, so we're back to this. If I add two reactions, um, does anyone remember what I do to the equilibrium constants? This is digging back. If you add two reactions, you multiply the equilibrium constants. Um, what do we do to delta G? This now is in pretty good analogy to Hess's law. So if we add two reactions, um, what do we do to the delta G values? We add them. If we flip a reaction, that is switch products and reactants. Yeah, someone um, typed into the chat box that we take the inverse of K, that's right. So sort of one over K. And what do we do for delta G? Now, remember that delta G is products minus reactants. Um, and as someone mentioned, that's like the Y value of the products minus the Y value of the reactants on that energy diagram. If you've switched which is which, now you take the negative of delta G. Change the sign of delta G, or if you prefer to think about it this way, multiply delta G by negative one. If we multiply a reaction by a coefficient, that is if like if I need two of them to get something to cancel.
you raise k to that power, you take that coefficient and make it an exponent, sort of like we do when coefficients become exponents when we're doing products over reactants. And what do we do to the delta Gs? Well, if you have twice as many products and twice as many reactants, multiply delta G by that coefficient. Okay, take a moment to get these um, all in one place in some notes, because this is exactly what you need to do for question four that's below here. Um, so question four towards the bottom of the screen says, please consider the following two steps and calculate the overall delta G naught of reaction. Uh, some abbreviated chemical, this happens to be acetic acid. If you go onto organic chem, you'll probably see this abbreviation. If you don't, you might not. And that's okay. Um, so here, an acid reacting with water to make H3O plus plus the conjugate base. In this case, that's acetate. Um, that's okay as long as you can do the bookkeeping here. Um, you don't actually need to know the names of the chemicals, which is kind of nice. And then mercuric acetate, um, which is this chemical right here, reacts um, to make mercury two ions and two acetates. And hey, this looks like a acid equilibrium and a solubility equilibrium. And one of the things that I like about chemistry is that the same rules apply no matter what the case is. That is products of reactants is still products of reactants. Um, question or comment was, we can't see your work. Um, can you see the screen at all? So I'm not writing on the screen right now, but can you see um, the table that I've written at the top and the exam two that's at the bottom? Give me a yes or a thumbs up or something. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I haven't written on it. I'm going to write on this in just a second. Um, so thanks. What do I need to do to these two reactions um, here and here? What do I need to do to those two reactions? Manipulation from reactions above, add, flip, and multiply. What are the steps that I will do to those two reactions to get them to add up to this overall? Let's see, I start to look and say, okay, so somebody said flip. You're going to have to flip one, but which one are you going to have to flip? Bottom one. Okay, you're going to have to flip this. I agree. And someone else said we're going to have to multiply the first reaction by two. I think, yeah, you're totally right. So here's what we'll, there's the, my process is to just pick one of these chemicals and say, all right, is it in the right place? So I'm looking at the mercury acetate and say, is that a reactant in the overall or is it a product? That's a product. So that one needs to be flipped. Um, and Caitlin said we need to multiply the first reaction by two. Why, how did you know that? Um, well, let's look, okay, this, this ACOH is in the right place. It does need to be a reactant, but it won't be the right number of them. That is, I need two um, ACOHs and I need two waters. So if I multiply this by two, then I'll have the right number of things. And then once you've done that, you can add them. Okay. So let's see here. If I flip that first one, oh no, I multiply the first one by two. So I multiply by two and I get two ACOHs plus two waters, still liquid. It's in equilibrium with two H3O plus, plus two ACOH minus. Um, how can I do this? Can I, will this work? No, that won't work. This will work. Okay. I'm trying to make myself some more space here. Because I want delta G. equals what? So I took the, that reaction I multiplied by two. I need to take this delta G and apply the rule from the table. It's not an OH. At the, oh, right. Thank you. Thank you. 
yeah, so a couple people caught that. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, so somebody said we multiply this delta G by two. So if I have this table when I'm doing this practice, um, this is not something you'll get when you do the exam because um, I give you equations and constants and things like that. But what you um, will probably practice from is a table like this, where you say, if I, add, if I multiply the reaction by coefficient, what do I do to the delta Gs? I multiply delta G by that coefficient. Um, so someone asked about the second one when you flip it. Um, that's exactly what you do, yeah. Um, we'll get to that in a second, so nice work. OK, so if I take 22.7 and multiply by 2 to get the new delta G for this reaction as written with the new coefficients. 27.2 times two is 54.4, I have a space here, but such is life, kilojoules per mole. If I were taking an exam, I'd be writing on the desk right now. Not good for partial credit. Um, so that's that one. Um, for the second one, we flip that. So let me write that and see if I can do that with a, only a modicum of typos in it making life difficult by not doing it as is. Let's take the re reactants and write them as products and products and write them as reactants. Yep, making life difficult, then I'm singing about it. Okay. HQ. Um, so someone asked, do we, if we flip that reaction, do we then make the delta G negative? Um, I go up here to say flip a reaction that is switched reactant. And um, I'm in the delta G zone, so I multi -delta, multiply delta G by negative one. That's exactly what I do. I take the delta G that was given to me and I make it negative. business class that's in Chem 111, or in uh, Library 1188 after this, if I were doing this on the desk, they would see all these weird things written on the desk. Okay, now I add these two. Well, let's make it to add the reactions first. Add the reactants, add the products. I get two acetic acids plus two waters. Plus mercury plus two of these guys. It's an equilibrium with, I'll get rid of the phases for now so we have space. Okay, do I have anything to cancel? I do, um, you usually will, but I have two ACO minus um, that conjugate base on either side. Um, if I rewrite this, does that get me to the overall? I think it does. Is that the overall that was given up here? I think it is. Yeah, I got the products in a different order, but that'll work. All right, so what's the delta G? Um, if I added these two reactions, what do I do to the delta Gs? Let's go up here. If I add the two reactions, what do I do to the delta G values? I add the delta G values, okay. So delta G overall equals 54.4 kilojoules per mole plus negative 53.9 kilojoules per mole uh, 54.4 minus 53.9 I get 0 0.5 kilojoules per mole um, was that one of the answers? Go back up to the left and yeah, indeed it was, that was A, okay. So we went through that pretty systematically. Um, uh, 
Um, if you see these, so a couple of people jumped right on, on the idea here and said, okay, yeah, we multiply one and we flip the other. If you can see these, that's fine. Um, being, being systematic about this is good. This one, as you can see, I took up way too much space. Um, so you probably would want to use scratch paper if you're doing this the full way. Um, questions about that one? What questions do you have? Okay, cool. Um, how's the audio? Give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down for the audio. And then someone asked a question of how do we know to multiply by two? I'll get to that in just a second. But give me a thumbs down or a thumbs up or a thumbs down um, for how the audio is. Is it coming through? I bought one of these gamers headsets um, and I grew up playing like regular Nintendo. So this is sort of new to me. Okay. Okay, so a couple of questions. Um, first question that I got was, how do we know to multiply by two? Um, this is one of the cases of chemical problem solving where as far as I know, there's no a priori, there's no like step-by-step -step way to absolutely know how to approach these. It's sort of puzzle solving where you try things and see what works. Um, but the two steps that I do when I look at these multi-step reactions is I first look to see if I need to flip any chemical or flip any reactions. And the, so someone just asked about that. So why, why do we flip one? Because I look at what's written in the reactants and the products for these steps right here. In the reactants, are these all already in the right place? ACOH is the reactant as given to me and it is in the overall. So I do not flip the first reaction. Um, same thing with H2O. Whereas HGOAC2, is given to me as a reactant, but that's actually here in the product. So that's how I know I need to flip that one. Um, and then, okay, so that's how I know I need to flip that one. And then after that, then I look to see if my coefficients are right. That is the coefficients start as you know whatever they are and they balanced equations, these half equations given to you. Um, I say, okay, do I, in the first one I had one O C OH. Do I have one in the overall reaction? No, I have two, so I need to do that. Um, that's how I do those two steps. Um, let's see, let me go back to these questions here. Okay, so that, someone asked, does that, um, how did you multiply, no to multiply by two? Um, I look at what's given to me in the, the partial reactions and see if the numbers match up in the overall. Next question was, how does writing out the full chemical reactions help to solve for delta G? Um, if you can do it without doing that, that's fine. Like if you can see in your head how to manipulate these and then figure out how to manipulate and add the delta Gs, that'll work. Um, this I like because it says in a very systematic way, okay, if I multiplied this reaction, which I'll underline in sparkle pen right now, if I multiply this reaction by two to get to here, then I had to multiply the delta G by two to get to here. So it's a way of keeping track, bookkeeping, I guess, is why writing out the full chemical reactions can help. Um, another question was, do we have to do all of that or can we do what we got to do to the K values? Um, so here, these are delta G's, not K's, but if you, if you, again, if you, if you see what you have to do, then you can do it. And you can, if you arrive at the right answer and it works every time, then you're, then it's okay with me. Um, why did we flip the second step? I think we covered that. Um, will there be solving for Q? There could be, but it won't be exactly like this. Um, we don't have these multi-step processes for Q. We have them for K, we have them for delta G, and I guess delta H, and we have them for uh, voltage, which is something we'll do in the electrochemistry chapter. The rules should still apply to Q, but I've never seen anyone actually do them with Q. Um, another question was, does it matter which reaction you flip? Yes, it does. Um, it does matter which reaction you flip because if you get if you flip the wrong one, then you'll change the sign on the wrong one. So you need to look at what's in the reactants and what's in the products and decide which of these reactions you need to flip to get to the overall. Okay, a couple of good questions there. Okay. In the overall reaction here, looking at number five, in the overall reaction presented in question four, um, what was the sign of delta S? 
oh man, I got delta G's. I didn't get any information about delta S. Get to the regular dark pen. Okay. Um, someone put in the comments, is the sign of de delta S bound by looking at the phases? Yeah, that's exactly what I would do. So I would look at the overall. And if you're going from gases to liquids, well, let's see, what are we doing? So you're looking at the phases in the, we have aqueous, liquid, aqueous, and in the products we have solid and aqueous. So reactants have two moles of aqueous for the ACOH plus one mole of aqueous for the HG2 plus. And two moles of liquid. So here I'm looking at the overall reaction in question four, products have, that's HGOACS, that's one mole of solid, and two moles of aqueous. Which of these has, is, has more order or has fewer ways you could arrange it? Um, as you go from aqueous and liquids to less aqueous, fewer moles of aqueous things plus solids, that has less randomness, um, is, is the oversimplified way, but useful way to think about this. I guess our more ordered is probably a better way. Question was, isn't mercury acetate solid? It is. And I think that's accounted for here. So if the products are more ordered, the sign of delta G excuse me, sign of delta S is negative. Yeah, I mean more ordered. I don't know what I said, but yeah, someone asked, do I mean more, or oh, what do I mean more ordered? Um, solids have fewer ways that you could arrange them than a material dissolved in a liquid. That is, it's all packed together, generally not moving around very much. Um, so you can imagine like solid table salt. It is what it is in that crystal structure and moves very little, whereas salt dissolved in water can float around all over the place and order itself, um, let's use a different verb, can arrange itself um, in different parts of the water that it's in. So if the products are more ordered, that is more solids than liquids or more liquids than gases or fewer moles of gas, that kind of thing, um, then delta S is negative. And the way, that I remember what the signs are is actually by this same equation, delta H minus T delta S. Um, if you look at the signs here, um, if you look at the signs here, delta G and delta H go in the same direction. So negative delta G means spontaneous, I'm oh, sorry. That means delta H being negative favors spontaneity. You need to actually calculate delta G if you want to know if the thing is spontaneous. But if delta G is negative, that's helping you go in the right direction. Whereas the, this has a negative sign in the equation. So if delta S is positive, then that favors spontaneity. I got a couple of questions that I'll get to here. 
Okay, so a couple of questions. One is, are solids more ordered than others? In the context of this, yeah, you can think of solids as having lower entropy. Um, solids having less disorder, fewer ways you could arrange them compared to liquids, and liquids having um, less of that than gases. Let's see, which is more ordered between aqueous and liquid? I actually don't know. I think it depends on the molecules. That's a good question. Um, I'm not going to ask you to distinguish between aqueous and liquid. We're going to be doing things like going from lots of moles of gas to very few moles of gas, which would be more ordered. Um, another question, so is this a good way to think about this, if, is if delta G is positive, then delta S is negative and vice versa. Not necessarily for the reaction. For the reaction between delta, um, I would look at this equation that's down here at the bottom of the screen. I'll put it in a box. The equation delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Um, delta G being negative is spontaneous. Delta H being negative favors spontaneity, but it doesn't mean the reaction is spontaneity. And delta S being positive favors delta G being negative because of this negative sign here. Um, and another question of clarification, does gas have the highest entropy? I'm trying to think about how to phrase the answer to this so I don't say something that's physically untrue. And I get into trouble with this finding the right words. I think what you want to do is compare products and reactants. If we have two moles of chemical A, which is a gas, in equilibrium with three moles of chemical B, which is a gas, products have more moles of gas. So delta S for the reaction is positive. And there's a question about plasma. I like thinking about plasma. Plasma is a gas that's ionic. So it's like a um, an electrically conducting gas, um, which I think is super cool. Would they have more entropy than gases? I've never thought about that. Um, I've never thought about the entropy change in tr transitioning from a plasma to a gas or vice versa. Um, one of the things that I'll caution here is that each of these is not the entropy of a chemical. These are delta. And everything that we're going to do with these is a delta S or a delta G or a delta H of reaction. So the delta means products minus reactants. So what you're doing is comparing the entropy that's in this system for the, when you have whatever products you have versus whatever um, entropy you have when you have the reactants. Um, so that's a way that I, I sometimes get caught up in the language of this, but I try to keep it right. Um, but the delta here is products minus reactants every time. Hi. Some good questions there. Let's see what else we got here. Oh my goodness. Molecules. Let's see if we can find all the thermodynamics on here, since that's what we're chipping away at this week. And then we'll come back and do these um, questions with acids and bases and buffers and stuff. Okay, so I'm scrolling through. Acid, pH, I don't see any delta G material. Oh, there we go. Please calculate delta G for the bronsted Lowry. That's one of those acid base. That's the acid base type with proton in it. Reaction of some chemical in water, as in question eight, at 298 based on the pKa. Uh, so I got delta G, well, given a pKa and a temperature, I'm supposed to calculate delta G. You remember that quiz where I tried to do the thing on the Google form and it only kind of worked because I put a typo in it? People nodding their heads. Yeah, me too. Um, so this is one of these things where I say I, delta G can equal many things. If I had delta H and delta S, I could calculate it. But I don't have delta G and delta S. I have a temperature. Does delta G equal anything that has a temperature in it? Um, take a second and get this question written down if you're not working from this. And then we'll go find it. We'll go to the equation sheet that's at the back of this practice exam, because that's what you go and get um, with your exam. And uh, then we'll find it from there. So I need to get something that has delta G naught 
and temperature, and I have a pKa, and I don't think I have any equations that have a pKa in it, but we'll find something. Okay, so let's scroll down here. If you have your notes, you may be able to find this quicker, but let's go to the end of this and find it, the equation sheet where I get delta G. Um, so let's look through these um, equations and see if we can find one that's got delta G and, and temperature. Okay, so this first one's got delta G, delta H minus T, delta S. That has delta G and temperature, but I don't have H or S, so I can't do that one. Here's gas constants. Then delta G equals negative, oh, hey, negative, great. Negative RT ln K. If I had K, I could use this reaction over here at the top right of the, of the paper. I don't have K, but I have PK. Can I convert between pKa and a k value. Ooh, if I scroll down just a little more, you can reveal the second square of knowledge and see that I can indeed convert between pKa and Ka. So that's what we'll do. Um, so let me set up this equation. I got a question about the gas constant, um, and I will address that in a moment. So I will need delta G equals negative RT ln k. Go back and put my naught. If I had R, which I do, and temperature, which I was given, and K, which I can calculate, I can calculate delta G. So let's do that. The question was, if are we still using the gas constant even if we have a reaction with no gases in it? Uh, the direct answer is yes, you are. Um, I don't know the historical reason this is called the gas constant. I think of it as a conversion factor between temperature, uh, basically saying how much does temperature affect energies because it has units of joules per mole and Kelvin, so let you convert between those two. Um, comment, K, capital K is used for too many things. I totally know, I totally get it. I, I can't do anything about it. I guess we could invent our own nomenclature, but then we'd have to change the world with it. It sounds like the kind of thing CSUMB wants to empower you to do to change the world, but I'm not sure this is what they meant by it, replacing K. Okay, so we got RT 298 Kelvin times natural log of K. But I don't know what K is yet. I know what pKa is. So let's find the pKa from above. So question eight, let's find the pKa. Scrolling back up, let's find the pKa question eight. I'm 6.80, so here at the top of the screen, pKa is 6.80, let's use that. Let's use that for question nine. pKa is 6.80. And I know from my squares of knowledge that that equals the negative log of Ka. So if I apply order of operations and move that negative sign and then raise both sides by 10 to the, I can find by solving that equation that Ka equals Point five eight times 10 to the minus seventh. Again, writing on the desk, it's tough out here. Um, and I'll put that down here. And you might say to yourself, hey, virtual John, I, I know that we just complained about how K is used for too many different things. You took Ka and put it where K goes. Well, equilibrium constants and equilibrium constant. Um, that is one of the things I like about these chapters. If you found something that works for an equilibrium constant, it'll work for an acid equilibrium constant. That's the Ka. It'll work for a base equilibrium constant, Kb. It'll even work for a Ksp. So this is kind of neat. If you have a Ksp, which you can look up, you can find out how much more stable the products and reactants are. That's cool. Um, let's see. Do I have an equation with only one variable? I do. Is it already solved for that variable? It is. This, this is as good as life gets. Well, let's, let's hope not, but um, it's pretty good. Okay, so negative 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. I guess I should cancel my units first, make sure everybody's happy. I cancel Kelvin and Kelvin. Um, I will take this through. Um, question was, how did I know 
the PKA was 6.8. Was it from the previous problem? It was. So in this one, um, I know we're jumping around a little bit to find the thermodynamics, but in this one, it refers to use basically use the materials you got from question eight, um, which I will try to be um, clear on when I do exams. But yes, exactly, it was from a previous problem. You have to you have to be given the PKA or the KA here. Okay, so I'm going to crunch these numbers through the calculator. 1.58 times 10 to the minus seventh natural log times 298 times 8.314 negative. I got delta G, whoops, not equals 38,000 and the units will come out in joules per mole. And you might say to yourself, well, some of these are joules per mole and some of these are kilojoules per mole. And I, none of the answers in this multiple choice question are 30, this would, if two, two sig figs, it would round to 39,000. Um, I can eliminate one of the answers because it's negative. I know it's not that. Um, I know it's not 39 joules per mole because I got 39,000 joules per mole. I actually, I know it's not the first one too because it's also not that number. Sweet. So if I carried the sine wave through, I actually didn't even need to do the joules per conversion to get from joules to kilojoules. I can find that. Um, you can, of course, do that through. See, joules go on the bottom, kilojoules go on top. And there are a thousand joules in every kilojoule, so that means 39 kilojoules per mole. What questions do you have? What thoughts do you have on this question, which is essentially trying to assess um, whether you can use this equation right here, the one I'm drawing an arrow to. So why is the answer not C? The answer is not C because the math gave me 39,000 joules per mole, which is not the same as 39 joules per mole. Um, another question was, is it always in kilojoules per mole? That's a really good question. Delta G and delta H are usually given in kilojoules per mole, just because of the magnitude that they usually are, whereas delta S is usually in joules per mole Kelvin. Um, just because they tend to be smaller. Um, how did I get the K value again? So to get the K value for this, um, often it'll just be given to you. In this case, I made you do one more step. I need to find PKA from question eight. And then do PKA equals negative log of KA. to solve for K. In this case, it's a KA subscript A because it's an acid equation, but it actually is the same process no matter what the subscript is, which is kind of nice. Um, question was, where is this practice exam? Let me see if this works. Um, I will try to continue sharing my screen as I go over to iLearn. Here at the top, give me a quick thumbs up in your participant window if you can see iLearn or my, my view of iLearn right now. Okay, cool. So it is coming through. So here we have the updated syllabus. The updated schedule is at the end of that. Um, I updated the Alex due dates even today. Someone said, hey, look, man, we need some more time. I said, okay, that's reasonable. Um, so the updated Alex objective due dates are here. Um, lots of links, lots of links. Last semester's exams for practice. That's, the, that's where this particular one is. So if I go in there, um, I have exam two, fall 19, which is what I'm working with right now. Um, let's see, there's one more, while we're here, there's one more thing I want to show you. Um, last semester was the one that we went to multiple choice. There are earlier semester exams, um, so it's, it's still me making the questions, so there's still a lot of overlap, um, but there's an entire folder of the previous couple of semesters worth of exams. So they're not multiple choice, but you can still get the practice in, and all of those have different versions of keys as well. Okay, question was, where'd it go? Question was, I'm having trouble conceptually understanding what we're doing and what delta G, delta S, and spontaneity actually mean. Yeah, let's do that. 
Okay, delta G and delta H. Delta G is called free energy. It is the total change in energy in units of joules or kilojoules per mole. Um, so kilo is just for convenience, but when a reaction goes from all reactants and products, let's do delta G naught. are one molar or one atmosphere if they're gases. To whatever the concentrations are at equilibrium. So basically, if everything is one molar, Well, if everything is one molar, um, then Q products of reactants is going to be one. Um, this is saying what happens in terms of energy as the reaction progresses towards equilibrium. If the reaction is not at equilibrium, it will shift until it is. Um, delta G is a way to quantify how much energy is released if delta G is negative. Or the energy absorbed or taken in required for input if delta G is positive. And it's the energy that's, let's say, released as the reaction goes from one molar to equilibrium. Um, side question someone asked, is Alex still due tonight? No, nah, I pushed it back. Um, so go check those due dates, um, but I give you a little bit more time to work on that. Um, so that's delta G. Delta H is enthalpy, and this is the one you did when you did Hess's law. This you can think of as heat, which is useful, um, or you can think of it as bond energy, which is uh, both of these are not quite complete descriptions of it, but they're useful. So the change in bonding energy, if the bonds in the products are more stable, delta H is negative. Delta S is entropy. Um, and this, again, people will often describe this as randomness as, or disorder. I think rather than actual randomness or actual disorder, I think a, a somewhat more accurate description would be the potential you have for randomness or disorder. Um, it's a function of the number of ways you could arrange a system. And what I mean by arrange is basically the, like the placements of all the molecules. Um, so if you're thinking about a material dissolved in a liquid, if you're thinking about, um, let's say salt dissolved in water, um, you could arrange the sodiums and the chlorides in all different places within that cube of water, if you picture a cube of water. Um, if you're thinking about a molecule, this is done later in organic chemistry, 
with basically it's asking how wiggly is the molecule. If it has a bunch of bonds that could rotate or lengthen, um, then you could do that and have it appear in lots of different conformations. Um, and then the products will be more random if that's the case. So Dylan asks, um, how is there a number for S if it's just a matter of the ways you could position? Um, that's something that I will talk about in greater detail offline. So if you're curious about that, um, we can go through that section in the textbook. Um, that's more detail than I want to go through here um, because we, we being me, um, decided what we were and we're not going to do for thermodynamics, um, which perhaps is selling it a bit short. But we have to make choices. OK. Um, so good question about how we get from the number of ways to arrange a system to in what would seem to be an energy term, but we'll talk about that in office hours if you like. Okay, um, so I think it was Jesse, someone asked, um, could we go through these terms a little bit? Um, so let me know, um, was was that helpful or do you have, does anyone have follow-on questions? Cool, thanks Jesse. Um, does anyone have follow-on questions for what these are and what they mean? Slope of a Van de Hoff plot. The slope of a Dutch plot. I think I should rename this a Stroopwafel plot. It would be a lot tastier. Um, the slope of a Van de Hoff plot was found to be 8,340 Kelvin. Wait, that's a slope with units of Kelvin? I know it's weird. It's not a temperature. It's just what the math happens to be. So at any rate, the slope is that number with those units. And the y-intercept is some number with no units. Okay, please calculate delta H of reaction. So what I need, if I don't remember which equation is Van de Hoff, because you might not, and that's completely okay, what I need is a, some sort of y equals mx plus b, because that's what I see slope and intercept. Some equation that's got this form, y equals mx plus b, and has delta H. Um, so I'm going to go to the equation sheet. You can go to your notes. You can go to the textbook. Um, if you're working on a computer, you can, of course, Google search Van Hoff plot. Um, Wikipedia has got a decent page on it. Um, let's go to the equation sheet and see if we can find that. Oh, scroll too fast. Do we have a y equals mx plus b that's got delta H reaction in it? Indeed, we do. And it's about to get sparkle star penned space space pen okay this has a y equals well let me get that out of the way because now i've made it annoying y equals m x plus b um, and i will take this equation and rewrite it above so i'll scroll back to where we can see the question um, but i wanted to see this is my process for looking through these and say all right i was told slope and intercept so i want something that looks like y equals mx plus b and i want an equation that's got delta h in it um, so let's do back up and do that one okay i will recopy this here ln of k equals negative delta h not reaction over r times one over temperature plus delta S not reaction over R. And let me scroll back down and make sure I got this right. As you see in the quiz, sometimes I, I, I in my past, I have dropped a sign. Um, so let's make sure I got all the signs right here and got this equation right. So I'll scroll back down, then I'll scroll back up and we'll get to work with this. Did I get this right? Natural log of the equilibrium constant equals negative delta H over R times one over the temperature in Kelvin plus delta S reaction over R. Okay, cool, got that right. And now, for question 10, I was told some information about this plot, this y equals mx plus b, but what I was asked for is delta H. So if I could set this up to be a single variable question and solve for delta H, I would. That's often not what we do when we see slopes and intercepts and plots and things. Um, what we'll often do is write out y equals m x plus b underneath them. 
and draw the connection that M is the slope. And that equals numerically negative delta H reaction over R. Um, that equals negative delta H reaction, which I don't know yet, that's what I want, over gas constant 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. And I was given a number that equals 8340 Kelvin. And this is where you can see um, the need for the slope to have units. And of course, if you plot something in Excel or Google Sheets, then it won't come out with units, right? You got to keep track of them yourself. Um, but the slope here with units of Kelvin will let me calculate a delta H in joules per mole, which is good. So let's rearrange this down here. I'm going to multiply both sides by negative 8.314. So I'm doing two things at once. I'm moving the negative sign and I'm moving this to get delta H by itself. So I get delta H for the reaction equals number I had for the slope times negative 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Get out my red pen, cancel my units, get out my regular pen, and do this math. Oops. Ay, ay, ay. And I get negative six, how many sig figs? Three sig figs. Um, as you can observe here um, and in the quiz, ha, 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 keeping track of negative signs is really, really critical in this section. I mean, it's always important, but here there are so many of them that come and go um, that having some sort of checklist or a way to pause yourself and make sure you've got track of all the negative signs in your equation um, is, is pretty important. So here we're still trying to answer question 10 and we've arrived at negative 69,300 joules per mole. I'll write that up here at the left. Um, near where I would like to circle one of my answers. Um, okay, so again, I can try to, I can, I can convert this straight to kilojoules per mole and see where that is in this, but I can also just eliminate things. So I have units of joules per mole. That's not the same as 69.3 joules per mole, positive or negative, so it isn't one of those. And I do have a negative sign, so it can't be the positive one. Um, so you can do the conversion and confirm it. Um, multiply that by one kilojoule per thousand joules, or however you prefer to do this. And you will wind up at negative 69.3 kilojoules per mole, which is, again, answer C. Um, what questions do you have on that before we go on to number 11? Okay, this is one of the strategies that I've mentioned will be something that shows up just again and again in Chem 111. Um, we do see a whole lot of, probably at least once a chapter, we see something where we have to use a y equals mx plus b and get some information out of the slope and the intercept. Um, so everybody try question 11 now. So now it's asking me to calculate delta S naught of reaction. Um, these have slightly different units because delta S has units of energy per Kelvin, which is neat because it's energy that changes with the, with the temperature. That's kind of cool. Um, and you're going to be using the same equation. Um, so still use the information from question 10. The slope of the Van der Hoff plot was that, the y-intercept was that, um, except instead of calculating delta H, you want to follow an analogous procedure and calculate delta S. So take three minutes now and see if you can calculate delta S if you would.
let's see as you get this Um, so as you get this, did I actually remember to, yeah, okay. As you get this, um, go ahead in the participants window and check yes, no, thumbs up or thumbs down for A, B, C, or D. Okay, so, so far people have, one person said yes, 15 said no, 16 said no, increasing number of no's. One person said go faster, which is either a comment on actually going faster or they click the wrong button. Um, okay, um, here down at the bottom of the screen, I've got delta S over R, that's the Y intercept from my equation that I, um, and squared in star pen over here. Numerically, that equals negative 1110 with no units. Um, what I will now do is say, OK, that is negative delta S of reaction, which is what I want, divided by R, the gas constant, and energy units is 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. And that equals negative 1110. And you say, but John, even virtual John, that has no units. And I'll say, yeah, but be patient. And it will. Because to get delta S, um, <laughs> it's the person, person talking about um, pressing going faster. No worries. I'm, I'm, I'm clicking things all over the place. So no worries at all. OK, so 8.314 times that, basically solving for delta S will get me times 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. If I keep the units going along for the ride, I will come out with units of joules per mole Kelvin, which is good because that's the units for delta S. And I wind up with negative 9,230 joules per mole Kelvin. Um, we can follow the same process Make some space up here. That we did before and say, hey, look, man, none of the questions, none of the answers are that. And we'll say, okay, well, probably I need to convert that to kilojoules then. And you can either do a, a process of elimination, which is what I demonstrated above, or you can just straight up convert the thing. And you should arrive at the right answer either way. That is B, um, this, whoops, I'll do it so you can see the negative sign. Um, there are a lot of answers that look pretty similar here, um, to be to be honest, right? There's a bunch of numbers that look the same. Some have negative signs, some are kilojoules. So it's worth going slowly and double checking, um, finding a way for you to be systematic, be it on scratch paper, be it organizing your notes better than I do, um, but a way to make sure that you're clicking, or you know, checking the right box for multiple choice um, to make sure you get all the points for the work that you did. Um, so that's Vantahoff. Um, there is a, a two-point form version of Vantahoff um, in addition to what you find here. But let's pull the Vantahoff equation down here below, and I want to talk about it just a little more because I think this is super cool. 
the fact that this works is really neat. Um, if you have questions about the mechanics of that, please do type them into the chat now. Um, and in the meantime, I will start working on talking through what this reaction can do for us, or this equation can do for us a little bit. Okay, this is equilibrium constant. Enthalpy, which again was in our case the relative bond energy of the products and the reactants. This is gas constant, which for us is basically a conversion factor. This is temp in Kelvin. Um, and this is entropy. So, sort of how different the products and reactants are in terms of the way they can be spaced out and arranged or wiggly. Okay, so if I'm gonna plot this as a y equals mx plus b, what are the things I'm gonna plot? I'm gonna y, my co whatever column it is, if I'm plotting it in Excel, I'm gonna set up to be the natural log of the equilibrium constant. So the thing I have to actually measure is equilibrium constant. Then I take the log of it. Um, what am I gonna plot as x? One over the temperature in Kelvin. So again, I'm not gonna measure one over temperature, but I'm gonna measure temperature. Okay, so what this means is that if I vary the temperature for a reaction and I measure the equilibrium constant products over reactants, which um, there, there are a lot of different ways to do that. If you're in 111L, you did this, um, not, not the temperature part, but you measured the equilibrium constant with the spec. So that was the iron thiocyanate lab. You did some gymnastics, did a limiting reactant type of thing, dropped the Chatelier's hammer on the reaction so you can measure an extinction coefficient and then measure absorbance. So you can measure the amount of products and get a value for K. What you could do here, according to this reaction, is do that again at a different temperature, and again at a different temperature. And eventually, if you have enough of these, you can plot them. And from the slope, which is uh, from the slope here, and the y-intercept here, just by changing the temperature and watching a color change, you can calculate numerically the difference in bond energy between products and reactants, the delta H, and the difference in randomness in a quantitative way. I think that is just crazy, just super cool, that by varying the temperature and watching how much products you get, you can measure all sorts of different things. Um, and this is something that if you go through grad school in science, you, you often have to work on something that's pretty close to cutting edge because that's sort of the way that you do things. You have to do things that haven't been done before, right, to get grants and publish papers. Um, and there's all different ways you can do that, but but you often forget that these fundamentals will always work. So if you're doing um, a new system, a new enzyme, a new whatever um, that you're studying, and this hasn't been done, do this, because you can publish it and it's gonna be super important for the people that work with it. Um, all this comes back to the fundamentals. Okay, um, questions or thoughts on the Van Hoff equation? Okay, cool. Um, so what else do we have for thermo? Going through this practice exam, we've got solubility, that's molar solubility. Okay, more solubility. Precipitate, hey, that's solubility. Saturated, unsaturated, that's solubility, that's it. So that's the thermodynamics that we had on this exam. Um, what would I do now? Um, the Alex is pushed back a little bit, so go double check the due dates on iron there. But actually, let's do that, let's go to iron now. Um, so while we're here, um, for more practice on thermodynamics, you will of course do the Alex, that'll be good. Um, but the last semester's exam, that's the one we were just going through. Um, it's a question about lab, I'll get to that in a sec. Um, but you can also go to this folder here, earlier semester's exams, um, and go to, oh goodness, look at all this mess. So let's look at one of the exam two, exam two, fall 18, going back in the day. If I look at that, um, 
internet is cranky. I'm asking it to do too many things, but this might work. Hey, that shows up all over the place. Um, delta H, delta S, and delta G. So you can go through these and get more practice um, questions. And these in that folder, in addition to the exams, whoops, wrong one. In addition to the exams themselves, there are also the keys. Um, so it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, what it would be described as an eye chart. A lot of letters to try to tell the difference. But for each one of these, there'll be an exam and a key. And some of the keys have just the answer. Some of them have just the methods. There's all sorts of mess in there, but you can figure it out. Okay, the question was, um, do we still have lab? Um, you should have received emails from your instructors about that. Um, so I'll make sure that if they haven't sent that, they have. Um, we pushed back the practical a little bit, so we'd have a little bit more time to prep for that. Um, yeah, so that's that's about, is lab on Zoom? I believe that the instructors will be setting up Zoom links, um, but they've decided to push that back a little bit. So you have um, a practice worksheet will be coming for the practical. If that hasn't gone out yet, that'll come very soon. Um, when is the next open pie in Alex? I don't remember, but I can figure it out. I believe it's after um, you do this current assignment. And is the lab practical the week uh, after the week of spring break? I'm actually not sure. Um, so we'll send out an updated syllabus for lab. Um, cool, so the only other thing, that I want to show you is here on iLearn, um, and that is some people have been using this already. That's the Google Help Forum. Um, quite a few people have used this, and it is a good way to ask and answer each other's questions, and people paste um, screenshots from Alex and all sorts of different things, um, and I answer them, and I usually remember to put mine in bold. Um, and sometimes it takes me a minute to find the questions. Uh, the answers to your questions. But this is a really good place to check in with me because I check this pretty much all day. Um, all right, thanks everybody. Um, I hope that was useful for you. Please do give me feedback. Um, in email is probably the easiest format for now. Um, but let me know how this is going and how it could be better. Um, so thank you everybody very much for your participation. Um, a couple of people say they need a coffee break. I think I do too. Um, so I will get in touch with everybody. Um, and so if you, there's a couple of questions uh, populating here about the lab. Um, look for a post um, probably from Dan McDonald, but it could be from any of us to say in general, here's the here's the schedule for what we're doing for the rest of the semester. Um, In-person meetings are not happening, um, but we'll get all the rest of it going and get you figured out how to get as much content and technique as you can. Um, all right, thank you everybody. Talk to you soon.